Good afternoon. Welcome to the NASA Blacks in Government Annual Black History Month Program. I am grateful for this opportunity to hear from true trailblazers um, today. My name is Melanie Saunders, and I'm NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator. Uh, Jim Bridenstine sends his regards and his regrets, and he regrets he was unable to be here in person, but his loss, my win, so thanks. Um, sometimes the schedule works in your favor. Uh, today we're going to hear some stories of trailblazers near and far who persevered through many challenges. NASA knows that a proper reflection of the past will help us prepare for a successful future. Reviewing the stories of the past and present renews our resolve to emulate their examples to help us confront the challenges that still persist. NASA fires, uh, fosters a, an environment of inclusion and respect for all. The agency continues to value and appreciate the strengths afforded by both the commonalities and the differences in individual employees, which drives our innovation and creativity. Our agency is engaged in an ambitious mission to return to the moon sustainably and then use what we learned there to go on to Mars. Through our Artemis program, we will land the first woman and the next man on the lunar surface by 2024. I believe I speak for everyone here at NASA, especially including uh, Administrator Jim Bridenstine, that this time when we land on the moon, we will do so with all of America. The exemplary lives of um, Honorary Brigadier General Charles McGee, uh, very famous with the Super Bowl and the State of the Union in your recent past. I thought my schedule was busy, but you're, you know, it's very impressive. Um, and our very own astronaut, uh, Alvin Drew, demonstrate to each of us that we can go higher and further than we ever thought possible. Their lives embody this fundamental truth, an American truth, that together we can overcome any obstacle and together we can successfully um, explore any frontier. I eagerly look forward to hearing from uh, these two trailblazers later in the program and I'll be following the progress of future trailblazer Young Ian, um, also of a fairly widespread media last night. That was great. You did very, very well. Um, so I'm now pleased to introduce our next speaker, Associate Administrator for Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, Bob Pierce. Bob manages the agency's aeronautics research portfolio and guides its strategic direction. As the aero guys like to say, NASA is with you when you fly. Uh, I fly a lot and that's a comfort to me. So will you please join me in welcoming Bob Pierce. Okay, good morning. It is a real pleasure and honor to be with you here today to provide opening comments for the Black History Month program entitled Trailblazers. And first, let me recognize what an honor it is. It's always an honor to be um, on the stage, to be with, with one of our NASA astronauts, so Colonel Drew, um, a pleasure to be with you. And it's certainly a singular honor and pleasure to be with a Tuskegee Airman, General McGee. Your service to the country is um, just outstanding. And we certainly salute you for everything you've done um, on behalf of the United States and in your trailblazing service. As Associate Administrator for Aeronautics, I think trailblazers is, is really an excellent theme. I spend much of my time looking at the future, the future of aviation. How can we improve travel? How can we improve aviation? How can we improve the competitiveness of the United States? And in, in doing that, improve the experience of the traveling public. Let's make aviation faster. Let's make it more efficient. Let's make it more sustainable. And let's make it safer. On behalf of, of everyone, all of our, our fellow citizens, both in the United States, but also all over the globe, to make aviation a, a, a continue to be the form of transportation that links all of us together. But to make this, this future happen, we need trailblazers. Trailblazers like Colonel Drew and General McGee. Advances in aviation and aerospace in general can be viewed oftentimes in very mechanical terms, right? Big complex systems operating at the edge of the envelope. But we all know here that it's a very human endeavor and it's those iconic images of humans and their machines that stir wonder in all of us. But to achieve that future, to achieve it, we need to acknowledge the human history and build upon it. In fact, when we celebrate our history, we encourage future generations to reach beyond what we have achieved and to go to new heights. So early aviation pioneers like Bessie Coleman and Dale White paved the way for the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II and on to astronaut Guy Bluford, who paved the way for Mae Jemison. And the diverse astronauts that will explore the lunar surface beginning with the first woman and the next man in 2024 will be the next trailblazers. So there's a continuity and a 
continuum between the trailblazers and NASA is certainly the place where often that comes together. And today's talented African-American engineers and scientists follow the now famous hidden figures like Katherine Johnson and Mary Jackson at Langley, and also pioneers like Julius Montgomery at Cape Canaveral. But as we celebrate those achievements of African-American mathematicians, engineers, mission support specialists, scientists, pilots, astronauts during Black History Month, it's also important for us to acknowledge that they very often had to overcome the barriers and hurdles created by racial discrimination. Their individual stories vary, but there's a common theme in order for us to get the benefits of their service and their contributions, they had to demonstrate remarkable resilience and unwillingness to yield to those barriers. And I believe, I truly believe this is born of inherent optimism and hope for the future. And I think NASA overall embodies that, that inherent optimism and hope for the future. You know, as I prepared for the event today, the opportunity to give opening comments here, I couldn't help but ask as I reviewed those stories, those stories of early pioneers and so forth, what I have achieved, what they did, where I faced with those same hurdles. And honestly, I don't, I don't know. But that's why we need those special people, right? That's why we need trailblazers to clear the path into the future. And I think the more important question is what the challenge of leadership is looking forward. We don't want people to have to fight to get a seat at the table. We want them at the table advocating for their ideas, fighting respectfully for their ideas and collaborating to make them real. I often talk about as, as, as a AA for a research mission in aeronautics, I often talk about that innovation is at the seams. And what I mean by that is great innovation happens when we join across boundaries, across seams, between people, organizations, cultures. We each bring knowledge, expertise, history, a way of understanding and solving problems. It's been studied and shown that bringing different relevant problem-solving methods to a complex challenge always yields a better solution. This is the benefit, one of the benefits, of diversity and inclusion. I'll provide a couple of examples of, of current black engineers and trailblazers that I work with that inspire me along those lines, and I'll apologize in advance because that means I'm going to leave out countless technical professionals and support staff that I'm not going to mention, but I'll mention a couple. So Anna Marie McGowan at Langley is a trailblazer in design thinking and transdisciplinary innovation at NASA. And whenever I talk to her, whenever I see her, she always challenges me to think differently. And I really appreciate that. Marcus Johnson at Ames with a cadre of colleagues is trailblazing convergent and collaborative innovation with the development of the US traffic management system. The approach that they're developing there is changing the way we think about the future, about innovation, how we work together, not just within NASA, but across NASA and industry and universities. The bottom line is we need collaborative, inclusive innovation to get the best solutions if we are going to create a transformed aviation system and if we're going to put the first woman and next man on, on the moon by 2024. That's the leadership challenge. It requires all of us to bring our best to the table, to be curious and continuous learners. And history shows us that the African-American aviation and space trailblazers we celebrate today have plenty of that. So I look forward to our two trailblazers that are with us to listening to their comments. And with that, thank you very much for, for, for um, listening during my comments. And now my next job as MC is to introduce um, Ms. Monica Manning, who is is our assistant, I'm sorry, <laughs> right in front of me, I'm sorry, uh, assistant administrator for procurement here at NASA. Monica. Sorry, I guess I didn't know you. Yeah, yeah you, you weren't expecting me back up here okay. because I was supposed to do my whole job uh, the first time. So this is what happens when you look at your talking points and not the agenda. So. I completely uh, overlooked the need to arise for the national anthem, so I apologize. <laughs> I know, I know our trailblazers never would have made that mistake. <laughs> Led by uh, Andres Almeida, thank you. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed 
at the twilight last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Now we'll return to our regularly scheduled programming with Monica Manning. Good morning. I have the distinct honor, privilege, privilege and pleasure to introduce our two distinguished trailblazers. I had the opportunity to speak with both of them in the back and they both are extremely excited about being here and are looking forward to any questions that you all may have. First, I will introduce Honorary Brigadier General Charles McGee. He was born December 7th, 1919. He was a sophomore at the University of Illinois when duty called, and he then joined the U.S. Army and Tuskegee Airmen Program during World War II. Brigadier General McGee earned his Tuskegee Airmen Pilot's Wing on June 30th, 1943. He successfully completed 409 air combat missions across three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And he served his country for 30 years, beginning with the Army Air Forces. He was presented with the Congressional Gold Medal by President George W. Bush in March of 2007. And he was enshrined into the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Brigadier General McGee as he comes to the stage. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing one of our very own astronauts, Colonel Benjamin Alvin Drew. Colonel Drew was born November 5, 1962, right here in Washington, D.C. He received his Bachelor of Science degrees in astronautical engineering and physics from the United States Air Force Academy in 1984 and a Master of Science in Aerospace Science from Embry-Riddle University in 1995. Colonel Drew was selected as a mission specialist by NASA in July, 20, in July 2000 and flew on space shuttle missions STS-118 in 2007 and STS-133 in 2011. He was the last African-American um, astronaut to uh, reside on the International Space Station. Please welcome me in joining Colonel McGee as he comes to the stage. <laughs> Drew, 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 Drew. <laughs> lights, if you don't mind. <laughs> Colonel McGee, well, 
like to join everybody in welcoming you here. And you're, you're having a heck of a week, a week this week here. Yeah. Been a right. good one, so thank you. Most of us <laughs> serve our country for 30 years. We, uh, we, we rest on our laurels and, and go check out um, what's on TV. Oh, right. But you, uh, you've got several bad habits like flying high-powered jets on your birthday. And when, when, when an age when I'm, <laughs> when I'm sure they won't allow me to drive. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll, I'll expand more on that introduction that you got and uh, just talk about that, uh, pick up the narrative. So we talked about the fact that you were born on December 7th, um, 1919 in Cleveland. Cleveland, yeah. Ohio. Yeah. So I'm a Buckeye, but Buc moved away in third grade. So okay. went Midwest. Okay. <laughs> so out in Kansas City, that area? No. Uh, Illinois and Iowa. Illinois and Iowa, okay. And then back to Illinois. Back to Illinois. So uh, that's why I ended up at the University of Illinois, because had parents and grandparents always say, you know, go to high school, go to college, get the education, because that lies a step through open doors. I've heard that narrative too. <laughs> you must have listened to them. So that's good, because that's uh, where I'd like to pick up the narrative here, um, on the occasion of your 22nd birthday. Uh, December 7th, 1941, which you probably remember for, also, uh, for very different reasons, uh, the date which will live in infamy, the date where Pearl Harbor was bombed. Yes, um, and you are at the University of Illinois um, studying engineering, if I'm correct? Studying engineering, but I was home uh, because of my birthday and with Christmas coming. And uh, literally, when the president uh, made that announcement, it was a little after four o'clock, but I was with the Coleridge Taylor Glee Club, and we were. My dad was in Gary at the time, and going from Gary to South Chicago for an evening program. We carried out the program, even though that drastic news came over the radio. Wow, that must have been some day for you. Oh my goodness, yes. can't forget. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So you are at the University of Illinois, and you are part of the. Uh, the venerable Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity out there? That was uh, part of, uh, I think, a good good step for me, too, because they focused on education, not just having fun. And, uh, <laughs> 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 and, and that paid off, so that, okay. that, that, that was important. And it's one of the things in my life that I always point to steps. You know, when I was little, it said, you know, Having parents and grandparents said, treat, treat other people like you want to be treated. A little bit later, uh, uh, joined the Boy Scouts. Mm. And I still say today, if everybody lived by the Scout Oath and the 12 Scout Laws, we'd have a different country. <laughs> you, went to become an, you became an Eagle Scout there, didn't you? I became an Eagle Scout and have been selected as the Distinguished Eagle Scout. Uh, it's so important. Again, it's some value lessons that we still need to pass on to our young folks too, so that's been part of my interest, interest there. And, but what it's also meant to me uh, in my life and following that in college was uh, fraternal precepts that uh, indicated that if you're gonna be first of all, you've gotta help others, and, and that's so important. Outstanding. You also a member of a group called the Pershing Rifles. Can you explain that one for me? Yes. Uh, fortunately, uh, I joined ROTC. I say fortunately because out of it, uh, learned to handle a rifle and became a part of Pershing Rifles. But because I was in school, my draft board wasn't pulling my number. Occasionally they did to meet needs, but fortunately for me, uh, they uh, didn't pull my number. Had they, I felt, well, I'd be on the ground in the mud with a rifle. <laughs> 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 but heard about the uh, aviation opportunity, and I guess my ROTC instructor said, well, go take the exams for pilot training. I did, and lo and behold, a f few months later, I got called to go directly to training at Tuskegee, Alabama for my pilot experience. Wow, so here you are, this Midwestern boy, uh, comfortably <laughs> north of the Mason-Dixon line, and you're about to head um, into the darkest depths of the Deep South Indeed. when Jim Crow is alive and well. Uh, what were you thinking? 
Well, fortunately, I think I didn't think about that that much that way. I was just glad that I had. Uh, That's the joy of being 22. <laughs> <laughs> that I had uh, classmates that uh, kept those of us not experienced in the southern mm -hmm. atmosphere. They let us know where not to go by gas and, mm -hmm. and you know, how to act. <laughs> But that didn't deter from the training that we got, and that was what was key. Okay, so here you are down in, uh, was it Moton Field, in Tuskegee, Alabama? Moton, well, yes. They built a separate airfield. Well, really, as you look at the now called Tuskegee experience, mm -hmm. um, part of the Army policy was that, uh, I think everybody knew we had the civilian pilot training program, and that was to get a build of pilots at a units could call on as they started meeting war needs. I think it was in Washington, D.C. that uh, one, of the, one of the persons that had gotten their pilot's license in that program went door, said, I want to be an Army pilot. Army's policy was, we have no black mechanics, so we can't use a black pilot. Fortunately, of the now called Tuskegee Airmen, the first really were the mechanics trained at the uh, Chinute Field Rantoul, Illinois Technical School. University is just 14 miles away and we learned about it. And that's how I first knew about the program. But all I can say is when I finally got called south, got that first ride, I was hooked. Okay. <laughs> and love flying and to be able to get off the ground and loop, roll, and spin, and come back and put your feet on the ground. That's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to tell you twice. So we're talking about now Aviation Cadet McGee uh, down at, at Moton Field. And your first plane was, was at that Boeing um, Stearman Cadet? The Stearman P a, yeah. PT-17. Okay, so yeah. for those of you, this is, a, uh, this is a cloth and wood construction plane. We, we, we lovingly refer to it as a rag wing airplane, so uh, this is uh, something yeah. that you would recognize in the middle of World War I in terms of the technology. Uh, this is, a, a, this is a talking about starting, but there you moved on to uh, an intermediate trainer with the PT-19 Cornell? Uh, no, did I didn't get that. All okay. of my uh, uh, primary training was in the PT-17, okay. and then from that, and that was at Moton Field under Tuskegee Institute's mm -hmm. aviation program. Basic was an advanced training, BT-13, mm -hmm. Bull T, and then the uh, AT-6 uh, at Tuskegee Army Airfield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was where you completed, to, where you got your wings? And fortunately, 30th of June, 1943, they pinned on those silver wings, so, and training was also as an officer, so became a second lieutenant. So now you are so gold yeah. bars and the silver wings. We were in hog heaven. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant McGee, Army Air Corps pilot. There we are. You still like the ring of that, don't you? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, the um, tell me about the transition you had from being this newly minted pilot who knows how to fly to somebody who knows how to fly and fight. Where did you go for your fighter transition planning, and when well, did you meet up with your, your fighter group? As they began to form the, form the units, uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield, of course, became pretty crowded, so uh, our combat training really took place up in Michigan, in uh, Selfridge Field, and then Oscoda Army Air Base farther up north where we could do gunnery out over the lake, and not disturb traffic. Uh, so we, uh, as I say, I graduated in June of 43, but December of 43, we were combat ready. Okay, so you were with your unit then at this point and going off right. to? Our training, we were assigned, and I became a member of the 302nd Fighter Squad. And in the Tuskegee program, for those that don't know, the first squadron that the Army expected to fail and then was the 99th Pursuit Squadron. And they were combat ready in December when I started my training, but no white commander wanted them. And they continued training for another three months and were finally sent to North Africa, attached to a white group, but not, they went, segregation went overseas too. They had their own base, 
they sent a pilot over to the to get their briefing, came back, flew their missions. But Colonel Bo Meyer said, told you they weren't good. They've only shot down one aircraft and ought to be patrolling Liberia. Well, how's it? history memory? Where is Liberia? Where were the Germans in North Africa? I think you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Far away from the actual front there, so hard, hard to shoot down enemies where they're not around. Yeah, but it turns out, uh, even though they had said that to them, a hearing in Washington said, found out the 99th bombs on target was the same as everybody else, only been there a short time, continued. And they moved out of North Africa into Sicily, out of Sicily into Italy. As they moved into Italy, the 332nd Fighter Group, the other three single engine fighter squadrons, we went directly to Italy. But amazing, although we were also combat ready in the P-40, they said, oh, you are going to do some patrol work. We switched to P-39 Bel Air Cobra, but still left training in Michigan on schedule, landing at the same time 99th was moving out of, uh, in, into Italy. We landed directly in Italy with the P-39, so they're flying the P-40 interdiction ground support 332nd Fighter Group was flying the P-39 Coastal Patrol uh, up to the Anzio Beachhead. But it was over the Anzio Beachhead that uh, 99th pilots, and I, I would say a bit of integration went overseas because when they were attached to the 79th, I think, as fighter group, Colonel Bates was just glad to have more pilots and more aircraft. So over the Anzio Beachhead, in eight-day time frame, the 99 shot down several German aircraft. So it was a matter of opportunity. But that's not where the story ends. For the 332nd Fighter Group, uh, um, we were only there for about three months, and. Uh, it turns out we thought we had enough guns on our B-17s and B-24s to protect them from the German Air Force. Wasn't the case. Sometimes 12 bombers go out and only six come home. 10 American lives times six, that had to change. Yeah. They put four fighter groups from 12th Tactical Air Force to move to 15th Strategic Air Force and begin escorting. Our B-17s and, and, and B-24s. 332nd was one of those four groups picked. Um, P-40, or, I mean, we were flying the P-39, not an interceptor by <laughs> any measure, and uh, we switched to P-47 Thunderbolt in combat. And I say that because we need to recognize the work that our mechanics did and making our flying possible. Because there wasn't any time to go to school and do a thing. Now today, you, know, you don't get anything like that without going to the school and, and lots of training. But in combat, you read the tech order. I, I used to say, if the uh, crew, chief, crew chief can start it, I can fly it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And, so you're, you're over northern Italy escorting these bombers, B-17s and B-24s. And uh, one day comes to mind here, August 23rd, 1944. Um, can you recall, recount oh, the events of that August, day? Uh, well, one of the things that, uh, and I might have to say here that B.O. Davis Jr., who had wanted to be a pilot when he graduated from West Point in 1936 and was denied because he said, we have no black mechanics. Um, he, became, he went through the first class at Tuskegee, became the commander of the 99th Pursuit Squadron, came home, became commander of the 332nd Fighter Group. He let us, rise second and first lieutenants, know that our job was there to protect American lives. And in fact, I think he, he actually said, I'll court-martial the pilot that goes happy hunting. Well, I don't know how many of you know what happy hunting is, but all of young pilots want to be an ace. An ace is 
getting five kills. Uh, he said, to us, we're there to save American lives. So we only left the bombers if dispatched or if the bombers we were escorting uh, were attacked. Even though there were German aircraft in the air, we didn't leave the bombers to go find them. We only left them if the German fighters tried to penetrate the bomber stream that we, we were escorting. And that, that paid off. Um, the, uh, and then I see in the picture up here, you see the red tail? And I remember wondering probably why the red tail looked if it was a war story, they probably heard that some pilot said, paint it red. <laughs> no. I mentioned the four groups picked from 12th Air Force when they joined 15th Air Force. Uh, the four groups, one was yellow tail, one was candy stripe, one was checkerboard, 332nd fighter group, red tail. And the reason was, fortunately, somebody at 15th Air Force realized the bomber crews need to know these aircraft suddenly showing up are friendly, not German. <laughs> and and uh, the red tails turned out to be one of them. And that story has kind of stuck because uh, of our leadership under Bill Davis Jr., uh, some of the bomb groups, not knowing red tails were black pilots, but said, by request, if we can get the red tails, they were happy. But it's because of the leadership that we had under B.O. Davis Jr. And so we didn't come home with an ace. We had one almost. <laughs> uh, but, but that's how that came about. And when you hear the, the words, it's important to understand what was behind it. Interesting. What a, what a great job. So as a result of that, yeah. Um, General uh, President Truman integrates the, the, the forces after the war. Yes, well, really, before the true story is, and I don't know that many folks understand, the Army never changed the policy. Um, the, really, there are five phases to the Tuskegee experience. Um, the 99th Pursuit Squadron is phase one, 332nd Fighter Group, phase two. When I graduated in uh, June of 43, my white instructor said, too bad they don't have a bomber pro program for you guys because I think you'd make a good bomber pilot. I didn't ask him what he meant. <laughs> 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 uh, he didn't know, nor did I. They had already approved, and three months later, they started medium bomber training at Tuskegee Army Airfield. So phase three of the experience, 477 bomb group medium flying the Mitchell B-25. Um, they're training to go to the Pacific. Uh, part of their story, well, I think it was the Pittsburgh Courier, and some folks, some of you may know that the Courier wrote an article once saying, oh, we're fighting for two victories, victory over Hitler in Europe and victory over racism here at home. That affected the bomb, bomb group. Oh, we went through some problems moving from Tuskegee to Michigan, uh, but uh, Colonel Selway, the commander of the base where the 99th was, I mean, where the 477th was training, had General Hunter's okay to say that even though Army regulation had already been written that there should be no segregation based on race, creed, and color at the time, um, gave Colonel Selway the okay to say on his base, trainees can only use the facility he designated. Why was that? He didn't want the black pilots going to the, the white officers club, if you will. Um, Army regulations, in fact, at that time, your club dues were taken out of your pay before you even received. Officers 477, fully aware of Army rules, um, tried to peacefully enter the so-called white club. Colonel Selway upset, 
called the officers in, please read my regulation again and sign this paper that, that you'll abide. The officers knew what the regulation was. They tried in twos and threes peacefully in a, the white club, were denied. That upset Colonel Selway, of course. Uh, so he asked him, please sign this, read my regulation again, sign that you'll agree. 101 refused and were immediately shipped off from Seymour, Indiana to Godman Field, Kentucky, guarded behind the worst treatment than German prisoners of war at the adjacent Fort Knox. Um, but they, that brought a hearing, <laughs> for okay. sure. Uh, I don't know where they sent Colonel Selway, but the Army finally said, uh, hmm, war's over. 332nd Fire Group has come back home. We'll have the 477th Composite Group. We'll keep two of the B-25 squadrons. Um, we'll uh, reactivate the 99th. Hmm, Godman Field, too small. Oh, we'll open up uh, Lockburn Air Base south of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, 477th Composite Group moves to Ohio. Uh, 19, this, of course, the war is over in 45, 1946. Training was d dying down. Those of us that, that were at Tuskegee at that time had not come home and were in training programs there. Where did we go? Lockburn Air Base, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, 1947, the Air Force separated from the ground forces. And the Air Force, oh, everybody wasn't for integration, but they determined, you know, we need to use people based on training and experience to fill our, fill our needs, not separated because of happenstance of birth. And we're not getting enough money to uh, keep a base open, Lockburn, and not able to fully use it based on our needs because of, of trying to keep, keep it segregated. So we need to integrate. They were back a few months later by a very courageous president, Harry Truman. I think he's the president that said the buck stops here. But he issued the executive order 9981 mandating all of the services need to integrate. Well, folks, if you don't know the history, the Air Force led the country in integration. Now, that's a statement and so on that everything takes, takes time. 1949, 1st of July, the Air Force closed Logburn Air Base and we were scattered around the world. Well, the Army and the Navy really came on board more fully during the Korean time, uh, Korean War, which came a few, you know, a few months, a few months later. But that's the way the experience of the now called Tuskegee Airmen served their country uh, and uh, continued to serve. And as I say, the mechanics, the technicians, and many folks may not know. The Tuskegee program produced some 900 pilots. There were some liaison pilots. Their story kind of get, gets lost because they were then sent to individuals, to Army units, units as needed. Um, but uh, that experience uh, certainly laid the groundwork for things to grow in, in the Air Force. You did. It, it broke the trail for the rest of us to come behind you, and we th well, thank you for your service. I personally thank you for making it an opportunity for me. Well, thank you and for thank the you statement. <laughs> round of applause for that.
I assume there's going to be a question coming from that. I think so. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we'll see what comes next. Sorry, I, was, I, was, I fell down on the job, I think, yeah. So. <laughs> I was, I was so riveted with the, with the story, it's hard, to, it's hard to kind of transition. Hey, so we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience for General McGee. Please, uh, we have, hopefully, we've got a couple of microphones here, so please just raise your hand. And Name is uh, Robert Weston, and uh, General McGee, <clears throat> uh, I went to school down at Tuskegee, and I'm one of those guys who was following in your footsteps. I always had a great deal of respect for you, and uh, it was far easier for us. I went uh, uh, to Tuskegee and uh, was trained by uh, one of the greatest pilots I ever met, uh, Chief Anderson. That's a gentleman I know that you remember from Tuskegee. Yes. He trained... Uh, uh, also, uh, General James and many others at that AFL. But I just wanted to s let you know there's somebody in the house here today who's from Tuskegee. I appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah. okay. what, what is key is that you mentioned people, uh, as I say, segregation wasn't changed but there were people who believed in the opportunity and did a lot to assure that the opportunity didn't, didn't disappear. And fortunately, uh, uh, we prevailed in a way that uh, it became meaningful, meaningful for many others. And as you say, you say you stand on our shoulders. Well, all I can say is, it's awful good that we were strong enough and yes. <laughs> tall, yeah, yeah. tall enough grateful, for yeah. you to, 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 to make that step. But th thank you. Chief Anderson, you know, Tuskegee Institute had a very good civilian pilot training program. And uh, Chief Charles Alfred Anderson was a self-taught pilot in the 30s. Uh, wanted to fly, but because he was black, he didn't have any help. There were a couple of the Army pilots, understand, across the country, I think it was in Arkansas or somewhere like that, that helped blacks to get into aviation, but many in that early year had to help themselves. Charles Alfred Anderson was one of it. He, I don't know whether he borrowed some money or was given to him, bought an airplane and taught himself to fly. But he loved to teach others to fly and probably had over 60,000 hours when he died. He always loved to help somebody else. And part of our story is Eleanor Roosevelt visited Tuskegee, I think it was for Rosenwald Fund program activity, funds that maybe have helped them to build Moton Field, whatever. But while there, she flew with Charles Alfred Anderson some 30 minutes. Of course, her escorts were upset, and even I understand they say they called Washington and said she wants to fly with a black. I understand the her husband said, if she wants to fly, she can. <laughs> 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 but uh, that's a part of the program type of person Charles Alfred Anderson was. He became the head of the primary training program for Tuskegee Institute that took place for us at Bolton Field. And of course, then for basic advance, we went out to the Army Airfield. But, uh, Chief was a wonderful person and continued to fly, and I think, until just a few weeks before his death. Uh, Chappie James, when I entered uh, my training, Daniel Chappie James was an instructor with Tuskegee Institute's civilian pilot training program. But you have to understand, he could play football, he could direct 
liked the band. He could probably play all the instruments <laughs> in the band. Quite an all-around person, but he was an instructor in Tuskegee Institute's program. Uh, somewhere along there, they, they were all civilian. The Army wanted them to become, come on active duty. Most of them wanted to stay civilian. He chose to come on active duty, so he immediately went through basic in bands, and as you know, became our country's first black four-star general. But again, opportunity, please. <laughs> so, even because of his interest in what he has done for aviation, I believe his, the family, is, there is a Tuskegee, I mean, a Charles Alfred Anderson Foundation today, still carrying on the name of someone who loved to fly and did so much for our growth of aviation uh, here in the country. But thank you for <laughs> coming. So is there another question? Yeah. You know, we're, we're going to run a little short on time, so we're going to move on to the, mm -hmm. the presentation. I just, let me thank Colonel Drew and, and, and General McGee. Thank you. I think all of us could sit here almost all day and listen to, to your story. It's just amazing. Thank so, you. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to bring up, back up, uh, Melanie Saunders, and I'm also going to bring up Zudea Taylor-Dunn and Laverne Randolph to do the presentation and some photos. General McGee, we have a little something for you um, that aligns with NASA tradition. Um, thank you very much for joining us here today. What an honor and a privilege it is for all of us to hear you talk about your amazing career and life. Um, so uh, this memento, which they're going to unveil in a minute, it's a um, includes uh, space shuttle program pins, which are the official NASA editions and contain medal flown aboard a space shuttle mission. These United States and Ohio state flags were flown to the International Space Station aboard the last shuttle flight, aboard STS-135, July 8th, 2011, to July 21st, 2011. And NASA is presenting this to you in honor of the courage, the leadership, and innovation that you have consistently demonstrated throughout a lifetime of achievement in the field of aviation for the inspiration that you provide to the next generation of air and space travelers and for your service to our nation. We offer our deepest gratitude from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, February 2020. Thank you very much, sir. Please. Mic on, so you can just. I asked this to say a word in thanks to me, what's most important, and I'd like to pass on to each of you. Are you mentoring a youngster coming along behind you? Whether it's in your family, in your neighborhood, or in the city, there are youngsters needing that. If you don't have a mentor, somewhere in your neighborhood there is one. Indeed, don't overlook that because those young folks are the future, our few spacewalkers. I tell middle school when I talk to them, I said, you all know we're going to Mars. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, guess who's going to make the trip? When it gets all planned, I think the planners are going to be too old, and I'll say, it's going to be one of you. <laughs> it's a message we need to take all across our country. And that's why I say to you, if you aren't mentoring a youngster, 
find one because they're out there and they are in need and they are the future of our country. So please, thank you so much for the recognition. That spurs me to stay out the rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. this time we want to also thank our Colonel Alvin Benjamin Alvin Drew um, we'd like to thank you for your support of NASA headquarters chapter of big um, your service to NASA our nation and to humankind so will you please accept this token of our appreciation Okay, so as my final duty today, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, the Langley Senate Director, Clayton Turner. Good afternoon. It's been an honor and a pleasure to hear from a distinguished trailblazers, Brigadier General Charles McGee and Colonel Alvin Drew. Their lives and their service to our nation is inspiring. We are fortunate to have such role models in our midst. General McGee, Colonel Drew are true trailblazers. They have blazed trails and paths for others to follow. They both remind us that as you blaze a trail, you must leave a path and you must be a guide. In that vein, my first day as center director, I spent with a classroom full of four-year-olds creating a solar system. So imagine the revolving and spinning and the glee of the four-year-olds and then think about the spark in those little minds that are gonna do, as the general said, take us on to Mars. I also spent time that same day with a classroom full of three-year-olds, and we talked about gravity, aerothermodynamics, aerospace engineering, and coding. And I know that sounds wild, but as I explained gravity, a three-year-old, when I asked why did the ball fall to the ground, she told me, because it wasn't a balloon. And she told me why the balloon went up. <laughs> so if you have the opportunity, as the general said, I highly recommend the experience. Having a bumpy day, go out and talk to some three and four year olds. Go out and talk to some middle schoolers. Go out and talk to somebody and make a difference in their lives. You know, as I listened to our honored guests and their amazing accomplishments, I thought about General McGee's courage and determination to break through barriers and to overcome tremendous obstacles to achieve accomplishments that many thought impossible, and how he is still a trailblazer today. I thought about Colonel Drew retrieving his dream to become a pilot and on to become an astronaut, and how his example illustrated that hard does not mean impossible, how he is sharing that lesson in deeds and words, and how he is still a trailblazer today. I thought about Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn, and their journey and the story we know so well today. I thought about the countless number whose names we don't know, whose stories we don't know, and how much they had to overcome and how much they achieved. And it's a legacy that we honor today. Just like General McGee and Colonel Drew, 
At NASA, we are part of making the impossible possible. As we celebrate our two trailblazers, let our celebration be a call to action, to follow their example, to overcome the challenges we still face, to inspire the nation as we take on the impossible. Just as power, powered flight inspired, just as Apollo inspired, Artemis will inspire, and as we land the first woman and the next man on the moon, as we learn to live and work on the lunar surface, as we learn to leave home planet and go on to Mars, we will inspire a generation. We will do these amazing things, and we will, as our honored guests have done, also inspire that generation, the Artemis generation, to not only join us, but to be prepared to go beyond us and to reach for new heights, to reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind. Thank you for being part of today's celebration. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the All Souls Church Unitarian Choir, who will lead us in the concluding song, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun March on till victory is won. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the Sing a song full of the hope 